I'm very glad to announce today's talk by Pedro Montero, our colleague from Chile. Uh, the title's on the screen, so Pedro, please. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation, and thank you very much, Ivan, for the for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to speak in the seminar. Actually, I have to say that the my very first uh, seminar talk uh, outside uh, uh, France, where I did my PhD, was in in, in Moscow, actually, in the Skovsky seminar. So I am very excited to to give a talk in the seminar as well. <laughs> I'm happy to be here again uh, online, but very happy to be here. So uh, the, this is a joint work with uh, Adrien de Boulogne at Dijon and Takashi Kishimoto and Saitama. And um, well, as the title says, it's uh, about uh, additive structures, uh, unipotent uh, structures, if you want, uh, on some uh, varieties, which uh, I will describe uh, along, the, along the talk. So which are called uh, Quintic del Pets varieties. So um, let me start with some historical motivation. Um, so this is a very old story, as you may know. <laughs> There's a very nice uh, uh, re uh, survey article by Julia and Ivan, right? So I suggest to, to you guys read it, but uh, just to, do, I mean, just to be, um, complete for the sake of the talk, let me anyways give you the, some notation and some some historical background on this on this problem. So uh, I, I can I will say that this the the story begins with a very classical problem by Hirschbruch, uh, uh, asking the following: You fix the uh, some dimension n, say, and uh, you you you're asked to classify all the the, the pairs x and delta. Uh, such that X is a complex projective uh, manifold of dimension N. Uh, actually, I have to say that the original problem it didn't ask uh, X to be projective, but it's way easier, uh, it's, it's more concrete for algebraic geometry. So I will only um, consider projective varieties. Uh, so X is a projective variety of dimension N over the complex numbers. Uh, as you will see also during this talk, we will relax this assumption of uh, being complex uh, at the very end. But for now, just uh, let's fix on uh, this, this context. And uh, delta is a, is a device or a hypersurface, as you want, uh, which is obtained by the following. You, you, you remove this, this uh, hypersurface or bunch of hypersurfaces, maybe it's not uh, irre irreducible, and you, you get an open subset and you ask, you ask that this open subset is isomorphic to the affine space. Or the other way around, you are looking for varieties. In such a way, there is a, there is a big open subset, a Sariski open subset, isomorphic to the affine space. And the complement is a bunch of divisors. OK, so this is your boundary divisor. Of course, if you are in, say, dimension two, you, you may have like a, one divisor on the boundary. You can pick any point on this uh, divisor and you can blow up and produce a new example. Uh, so in order to have, I don't know, uh, non-redundant examples, you may, ask, you may ask for some minimality assume, assumption if you want. And this minimality assumption can be stated uh, by, I don't know, asking that the, for the, that the second Betty number equal to be one. Uh, or the Picard number equal, uh, of x equals equals to one, if you want. So this is a natural condition in order to not obtain some some answers like from blow, blowing up or stuff like that. Okay, so this is the the setup. This is the problem. Uh, so classify varieties uh, pairs actually not only the variety x but the pair the the variety and the boundary. Uh, which is uh, minimal ones uh, that uh, compactify the, the, the fine space. So uh, nowadays, using, I don't know, the, the technology of uh, the console, the console divisors, uh, there are many ways to see it. Uh, we can show that these varieties has to be fun. But this was already observed by Kodaira by analytic, with analytic methods. Um, so I, I, I wanted to mention it. Um, so in this case, uh, X is a Fenny manifold, uh, which means that if you take the, the tangent bundle, this is a rank N uh, vector bundle, 
you take the determinant, you obtain the uh, line bundle, which is the anti-canonical uh, line bundle. And uh, the final condition means that this, uh, this, this line bundle is sample. So you can use this line bundle to embed your variety into a, a, a projective space. Moreover, uh, all these conditions implies that uh, the, um, the, the anti-canonical uh, divisor, if you, you, if you think this line bundle as a veil divisor, say, this veil divisor is, uh, has to be a multiple of the boundary divisor, OK? Uh, uh, by the way, sir, uh, but may I ask you yes. uh, some questions? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Uh, by manifolds, uh, you mean smooth variety? Yes, yes, yes. So your assumption is that the variety is smooth. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you for the yeah, yeah, for the. And uh, the condition perfect. that this second Betty number equals one is it equivalent uh, to the condition that Picard number is one or not? In that, uh, for the case of final manifolds, yes. So I would I would say that in this context, yes, it's equivalent. It will be it will be equivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, yeah, it's a very good question because I wanted to say something about about that. Um, um, actually, I will well I will say it uh, more precisely in a few days, uh, in a few minutes. Um, the condition that the Betty number is equals to one actually tells you as well that the, the boundary divisor is ir irreducible. The Betty two equals, I don't know, something, uh, R, say, uh, tells you that there are exactly R boundary divisors, uh, irreducible components of the boundary divisor. So in this case, it's only one divisor, and every single uh, divisor is li linearly equivalent to, to this boundary divisor, in particular, the anticanonical has to be uh, equivalent uh, to a multiple of this, this guy. So it's a positive multiple. So um, this is a good, uh, good point to recall some classical slang from final varieties. Um, ah, sorry, maybe for a small example, uh, if you take the projective space, of course, and you take a hyperplane, you remove it and you obtain the affine space, right? This is a classical way to obtain the affine space inside the, the projective space or or seeing that they find the predictive space is a compactification of the defined space. And uh, the boundary, uh, and I, yes? Pedro, may yes. I ask you why uh, delta is uh, not a multiple of some other uh, divisor? Why is, is it uh, is it per prime maybe? Ah, uh, I know, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just considering the, how to say, the, the reduces, reduces the structure if you want. Uh, oh. You do get an open subset uh, yes. as, a, as a set, as a Sarisky open yes. subset. You take the complementary, and that's it. Maybe yes. the, the non trivial part is that, but this is actually true that this is actually a divisor that is of co dimension one. This follows from hard talk theorem, if you want, or from some uh, commutative algebra stuff like a uh, cruel uh, main uh, principal uh, ideal theorem. Stuff like, uh, yeah. you, can, you can show that it's actually a co dimension one thing. Yeah, I just uh, thought if uh, it is possible that delta is uh, twice some other divisor, well, inside mm -hmm. uh, the open mm -hmm. part, and the anticanonical is some other multiple of the same divisor. So the coefficient right. m is not uh, integer then. But it seems that for manifolds, this is not possible, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. That's, that, that, that's exactly. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So it's always. Um, uh, Integer coefficient. Okay. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes. No, thank you for, for, for the for the remark. Uh, so uh, actually, this is kind of important. This kind of uh, discussion uh, because uh, in front of, in the context of final varieties, we know that the anti-canonical is sample. Also, we know that the that the Picard group is a is a lattice. Is a lattice. So you have to think your your anti-canonical divisor as, as a point in a in a lattice. And you can ask yourself how divisible is like, the same exact question that you you asked me, and so how positive is your is your anti-canonical uh, divisor? Uh, for instance, for the in the project uh, for the projective space, the anti-canonical divisor is m plus one times a hyperplane. So is a so the, the, the Picard group is a, is a line, right? It's a one dimensional uh, lattice. And this is the number n plus one. So it's not primitive vector, right? 
is a multiple of some other vector one, and uh, this uh, this uh, multiple this uh, dilatation uh, constant uh, measures how positive is the anti-canonical divisor, and it's called the Fano index. And you can show that this uh, index is uh, bounded and uh, can, I mean, it's one, two, up to n plus one, and n being the dimension. And actually, being n plus one characterizes the fact that this is a, the predictive space. So this is a very nice result because it's a somehow numerical characterization of the predictive space. I say this is a result by Kobayashi and Oshiai. And uh, for uh, um, the Fano index equals n, this characterizes the hyperquadric. You can convince yourself from the, to the other, I mean, that the, the quadric has n uh, as Fano index from the um, adjunction formula, for instance. So this is a, but it's actually a ca characterization of quadrics. I have to mention as well that the um, varieties with a high Fano index ha have been classified. Um, uh, if the Fano index is n minus one, uh, this will be very important for the talk. These are the called uh, Del Pet varieties and they're well classified by Fujita essentially. And A minus, minus two, these are called the uh, Fano Mukai varieties and they were classified by Mukai essentially. So this is the, and that's it. That's all what we know uh, till, till now. Um, okay, so this is our context. Um, so let me give you some, some, some positive answers. Uh, in dimension one, the, the answer is pretty simple. It's a P1 and, uh, and the boundary has to be a point. You can, this is actually a very funny exercise for, from topology if you want. First of all, since it's a rational curve, has to be the, the curve has to be P1. So the question then is how many points can I remove in order to get the affine space? And you can, I don't know, convince yourself that you can only remove one point because of the fundamental group if you want. This is a very nice, uh, well, of course there are other ways to, to see it, but I think this is a funny exercise of, of topology. Um, from the classification of surfaces, uh, Enrique's Kodaira classification, you can see that the only, um, only possibility, the only rational surface of Picard rank one is the predictive plane, right? So if the, the surface has to be P2 and some curve. So once again, the question is, you have a curve, say of degree D, what can be the degree? And this is also a very nice ex exercise I think in, when you first learn, learn about the Picard group, uh, you compute the, the Picard group of the projective space, uh, um, uh, say, minus an hypersurface of degree D, right? This is an open subset of the projective space. Uh, and you can show, I think it's an exercise in Harsher that the, that the Picard group of the complementary of a degree D hypersurface in the predictive space is the, uh, the cyclic group uh, Z mod D, DZ, right? Uh, so, okay. But you know from geometry that the complement is the fine space and the, the fine space is, uh, I don't know, a unique factorization domain if you want the, the, the ring of sections. So the, the class group has to be trivial. So, D has to be one. <laughs> so the, the degree of this uh, curve has to be one. So you can convince yourself that the, the complement has to be aligned. And this is, uh, uh, I, once again, a funny exercise. Excuse uh, me, Pedro, I'm uh, sorry for being stubborn. Yeah. I'd like to ask the same question. Let us take uh, P2 minus mm -hmm. uh, conic, minus a quadric. So uh, the complement is not A2, but uh -huh. uh, the uh, divisor is t t twice the line and uh, the anti-canonical divisor is the, the, the uh, delta is twice the line and the anti-canonical one is uh, 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 three times uh, the line class. So M is one and a half. The coefficient M right, is one right. but the, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, 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 all this final index is only for the for the whole variety, not for the open yeah. subset. Yeah. yeah, the final index is uh, three. Indeed. Yes. But maybe you, M should be final index. It should be final index instead. The M, letter M. Um, or, but I think that, uh, how to say, 
uh, you are looking for the uh, you take p2 you look at the generators of the picard group of p2 as say yeah. from the point of view of device or is this a line and uh, uh once you fix this isomorphism is uh, is isomorphic to z yeah yeah sure and, sure i'm just uh, uh, mm -hmm. saying that delta e, uh, well the the boundary divisor is not uh, necessarily uh, the generator of the picard group I don't know if it's true in uh, uh, for complement of the affine space, no, 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 but no, 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 no. they don't hold. Maybe yes, uh, but yeah, maybe maybe. But uh, how to say? Mm. Uh, but I, I, yes. I, I believe that in the case where the. Um, where the the complement is uh is actually the the fine space then it is the case yeah that maybe okay. this is is uh yeah. you're right you're right you're right uh, uh, thank you a lot no no thank you thank you for the it's important to think about this this kind of things <laughs> thank you uh, uh well for in dimension three the the, uh, the story gets complicated uh, actually uh, <laughs> there are many many people working this uh this problem, but I should mention that the I mean, uh, big contributions were made by Furushima, and he classified the uh, all possible pairs. So the, you have essentially four four varieties uh, and different the boundary divisor divisors. For P three, you have P three, and uh, as I told you before, the only possible uh, boundary divisor is a linear thing by the computation I. I sketch, so it has to be a plane. Uh, for the quadric, uh, well, there is a boundary divisor which is very nice, uh, but it's singular, but not that singular. Is the cone over a, a, a conic on P two? So this is, is there is a drawing over here, over here, over over here, uh, sketching the this uh, boundary divisor that I denote Q zero is zero two, and there are two uh, other guys B five and B twenty two. I'm using here Iskovsky, Iskovsky uh, notation. Uh, I won't say very. Uh, I won't say a lot about uh, B22, but I will use a lot B5. So I will explain what it is in a uh, in two minutes. But I want to. I wanted to say uh, one thing before uh, is that uh, for B5 and B22, there are two possible boundary divisors. So there are two non-isomorphic compactifications of the affine space A3 inside the, these guys. So this is kind of uh, a new thing uh, in dimension three. Um, and moreover, which is very interesting for me, and I think for you guys too, because this is a, a transformation group uh, seminar, is that all these varieties have an infinite uh, automorphism group uh, and are the only Fano trifolds with the uh, Picard rank one, which has an uh, infinite automorphism group. This is a result by Quite recent, uh, I would say, it by Kuznetsov, Prokhorov, and Shramov. So this is very nice because uh, this uh, this variety, compact, this variety is compactifying the fine space, also have many symmetries. Um, also, have well, I have to explain to you what is this B five. This goes back to Iskovsky. Um, uh, this tree for B five is very nice because um, I don't know how to say. It. It's a very it's a trifle obtained from very classical things that we know we learn in algebraic geometry, very classical algebraic geometry. So this is the following. So consider consider the, the Grassmannian, this will be our main character for today, 2, 5, the Grassmannian of planes inside C5, or equivalently, um, the same thing as the um, projective lines inside P4. So you have the, the Plocker embedding, and you can embed this variety G inside P9. Okay, you can compute this, the wedge product of uh, wedge two of C5. This is 10 dimensional, you projectivize and you get P9. So this is a six dimensional variety. So G is of dimension six. And you have to start to, uh, to take hyperplane sections uh, to reduce the dimension, uh, smooth hyperplane sections. So the first hyperplane section, which I call the Z is of dimension five. Uh, then another hyperplane section, which I call W, is of dimension four, and B is of dimension three, is your your trifold. Uh, 
If you want, just for fun, if you want to take another hyperplane section, you get the quintic uh, del pezzo surface, which is isomorphic to the blobob of P2 at four points. I put a five in all, in all these uh, varieties because they are quintic del pezzo surfaces, as I will tell you in a um, few minutes. Uh, so, but just recall I'm that sorry, the I'm sorry, I classical uh, construction, yes? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So Grassmannian has dimension six, right? Yes, yes. Our first section, which is denoted by letter Z, this is yes. one hyperplane section, it has dimension five. Right. Then W, it has dimension four. Right. And then B. B have dimension three. Right. So and this is, ah, start. and then you take blow up of the surface. And it yeah, just, just for fun, just for fun, just to, to show you that there is another classical thing connected to this construction. I see, yeah. but you're interested in a threefold. This is yes, yeah, yeah, I'm interested in the threefold. I only put the S5 just what to say, for fun. <laughs> okay, thank you. Show you that this, uh, this is a very, very classical uh, construction. Uh, well, so this is B5. Uh, the uh, higher dimensional cases are essentially open, but there are uh, some very important results and uh, positive uh, answers, if you want. Uh, uh, work from uh, by Prokhorov, uh, 94, uh, shows that if the, okay, if you're in dimension four, the final index uh, can be one, two, three, four, five. If it's five, it has to be the predictive space, as I told you. If, it's, if it is four, it has to be a quadric. So the first interesting case is Fano index three. And he proved that the only variety that can compactify the affine space is this W5 up, upstairs. So this is also very interesting B5 from the, for this reason. And um, there are four possible boundary divisors. Uh, Two of them are normal. Um, one of two of them are not normal if I remember correctly. I, I, I forgot, but the, uh, anyways, they are very explicit. It's a, it's a very nice work by Yuri Prokhor. And then- uh, Just a moment, just a moment. And here, here the variety has Picard number one, right? Yes, Picard number one. So all divisors are linearly equivalent. Yes. Uh, but this options different variants uh, for this boundary divisors. This is just, I don't know, the number of components of this linearly equivalent divisors. No, no, no. They're the only one, one irreducible, irreducible. But let's say, for instance, one is I, I, I'm making up something. One is more singular than other. But as divisors in the Picard group, they are the same. If you want linearly equivalent, but as variety, as as close close subsets I of think, the variety X, they are yeah. different geometrically. Uh -huh. So different representatives in the same class of linear. That's right. That's right. That's right. Different that's components. Right. Okay. That's right. Uh, well, actually, the same is the, the 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 same happens here for for B five. One surface is normal, and the other one is not normal. So, but they're they are the same uh, in the Picard group, but geometrically they are different. Uh, and Prokhorov and Seidenberg also uh, show the one dimensional family of four folds of uh, index two, uh, which are compactifications of. Uh, of, uh, of the affine space. And in all these examples, the automorphism group is infinite. So there are many symmetries in this, uh, in the all known examples. So it's not a natural thing to, to consider some, uh, an extra structure uh, for this mm -hmm. kind of varieties. And I will do so. <laughs> so let me go to transformation groups. So we will impose some conditions. Uh, so. In what follows, we will consider, say, a connected linear algebraic group, uh, x to be a, if you want, irreducible normal, but smooth if you want, projective variety. And uh, we will consider uh, GS structures. So it's a, it's a nice uh, regular action uh, on your variety. And in such a way, the, the general point uh, is such that the, st the stabilizer is trivial. And the orbit of this point is dense. So um, since the stabilizer is trivial, the orbit is actually isomorphic to the group itself, right? By group theory. Uh, and therefore, 
you can you can think this this uh, this nice action this uh, structure as an equivalent compactification of your of your group so th there is an an open subset the orbit uh, which is isomorphic to the group inside your variety uh, so there are very well known examples of this this, uh, this situation I think the the main example are toric varieties where the group G uh, the algebraic group is the algebraic torus um, and the, the variety X it has uh, is, is historic therefore and the nice and the nice uh, how to say thing that happens in this situation is that everything can be encoded into combinatorics and uh, well there's a very well-known theory of toric varieties um, right Okay, so but today we will be interested in additive varieties. Uh, so the the variety group that we will consider is the vector group. So it's uh, C to the n with the with the addition. So varieties with a G A N structure for for short I will just say additive variety because uh, it's short. <laughs> but uh, this is what I mean. Um, so as you may know as well. Uh, Otherwise, I can re refer to you to the nice survey by Julia and Ivan. Uh, this is a very long story. It, it started with uh, Hasset and Schinkel, essentially. And uh, for the projective space already, it's very interesting because they proved that they, there, are, there is an equivalent, equivalence between a structure, additive structures on the projective space, up to isomorphism, up to change of coordinates, if you want, and uh, isomorphism classes of uh, Commutative local art in C algebras of dimension n plus one. So I won't uh, explain the whole correspondence here because uh, I think it's not uh, really important for the for the talk. But I only want to give a an example, a nice example that I think should be given in in, in, any, in any talk about this topic. Is you think uh, two algebras of dimension three, so two polynomial algebras quotiented by some ideal. Uh, this is a three-dimensional vector space. Uh, as vector spaces, they are the same, but so, as algebras, they are different. For instance, you can look at the Hilbert-Samuel series, and you can convince yourself that they are actually different. And um, well, if you have a three-dimensional projective space, the, the only thing that you can do is take the projective space associated to it, and you get P2, right? <laughs> but this is as uh, the vector space level and then you remember that, that it's actually an algebra, and you can use the all the algebra structure to to produce an exponential. This exponential uh, should be infinite in principle, but since it's a, 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 lo, a local Artin ring, this is a, you are quotienting by some ideal. This sum actually is finite, and uh, the, therefore this exponential. Uh, defines a, a linear transformation, uh, honest linear transformation that can be written in coordinates. Uh, there is a basis for this vector space, one x y, and you can uh, write down the matrices you want, and then you get a, a, an additive structure on the projective space, and every single uh, additive structure can be obtained in, in this way. Um, here are the two structures that uh, we, we got with from, from these algebras. The first uh, additive structure, row one, is the most naive one. If you, for instance, if you consider the the the, um, the open the open um, uh, how to say um, open set x two equals one, then the action is very very simple. It's just uh, additive. Uh, I mean, the most naive action on on each variable. Uh, however, the, the second one is less naive, I will say. So the first one will be the naive one. The second one will, the, will be the not naive one. Um, actual, actually, the, the first one is also compatible with the, the toric structure on P2. So I will also call it the, the toric one. OK? And they're actually different. The first one has uh, infinite many orbits. Uh, for instance, if you take the line x2 equals 0, then uh, if you take uh, for row one, x2 equals zero, then the action is trivial on the whole line, right? So every single point on this line is, is fixed. So they have infinitely many orbits. However, for the second one, there is a, a, a non-trivial action on this line. And uh, actually you can show that there are three orbits. So they are very different. This is, I have to stress that this is not the case for, um, 
for toric varieties, uh, up to change of coordinate, there is, uh, a toric variety is essentially toric in a unique way. But the uh, additive varieties are, are not. So the, that's the whole point that I wanted to make. And uh, if you think a little bit, these are matrices, uh, three by three matrices, and they are commuting, comm uh, commuting matrices, right? Because you have uh, this uh, commutative uh, uh, structure on the on the group, so the 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 subject of commuter, commuting matrices is very old, actually very classical, and so we can we can uh, export results results from this uh, very classical uh, area of mathematics to this context, and we can now show, we can do it actually, uh, and we can restate a very very classical uh, result by Suprunenko uh, about commuting matrices uh, to these terms. Uh, of course, he didn't uh, state it in this way, but we can uh, we can reformulate the, uh, his uh, result by saying that if you if you want to count the number of uh, isomorphism classes of additive structures on on the projective space, then uh, well, for P one you only have one, for for P two you have only two additive structures, the those that I showed you, for P three you have four. Uh, for P4, you have nine uh, structures. For P5, you have uh, 25, and which is important for today because it will appear later. For P6 uh, or P7 and higher, uh, you have infinite, infinite, infinite uh, uh, non isomorphic uh, additive structures. So P6 can be additive in a very different, uh, I mean, there are many ways to be additive, infinite, many ways to be additive. Um, okay, so just uh, save this in your mind. And uh, well, using this correspondence, Hassett and Schinkel show the following theorem. If you look at um, pre uh, projective tree, a smooth projective trifold with Picar one, Betty two equals one, if you want, then uh, this is additive, which is a particular case of being uh, a compactification of the fine space, right? Uh, then, uh, you have to be the projective space or, or the quadrant. This is a very nice result by Hasset and Chinko. And um, let me just give you some uh, some a list of ingredients uh, that you are using in the proof because they are very interesting uh, for our, our purposes. Um, so the first is a uh, 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 property of additive varieties that I already told you more or less is that if you have um, that the Picard group is of the uh, of rank R, or if the Betty number is R, um, then uh, you have exactly uh, R irreducible components of uh, of the boundary device. So this is a very nice interpretation of this uh, topological thing. So Betty two equal one actually tells you that the boundary device is, is irreducible. Okay. Um, Maybe I should mention that there were uh, um, there is a work, a very nice article by Petronell on the on compactifications of C three. I think this is stated at some point in this this article. If you want to read uh, uh, the proof of this kind of fact. Um, another thing is that the anticanonical divisor is a is a is a multiple is a linear combination of these boundary divisors. Uh, with positive coefficients, but which is important here is that it's more positive than in, that, uh, than in the case of toric varieties. For toric varieties, you, as you may know, the anticanonical divisor is exactly the sum of the boundary divisors. Or, other, uh, or in other words, the, all of these coefficients A1, AI are equal to one. But here, for additive varieties, there are at least two. This is very important for because it's more positive and when the, as I told you at the very beginning, when the when the anticanonical is more positive, then it's kind of more easy to classify. So that's why we may have some hope to to treat some uh, this additive final variety. Uh, in particular, if the Picard rank is one, there, there's only one uh, divisor, uh, then the Fano index is at least two. So this rule out all the Fano variety of Picard rank of, sorry, of Fano index one. And I should mention that uh, from classification purposes, the Fano varieties of, of index one are the more complicated ones. So 
is a good news somehow. Um, now, the proof. Well, we know the Fukushima classification. We know the compactifications of the fine space, right? I, I told you, let me just go back uh, uh, very quickly here. They are classified by the FANO index, four, three, two, one. And I, I, as I already told you, you don't need to look at uh, the index one case because the, the equivalent compactifications have index two, three, or four. The index three and four are easy. So the only case that you need to, to treat is actually the, the case of B5. So let me give you a glimpse on the proof. So the contradiction uh, um, comes from, from a very geometric, actually, argument. Uh, there is a very classical uh, treatment of this threefold by Furushima and Nakayama. And they constructed a, a, bar, a birational transformation, a Sarkis of Link, if you want. But let me not be very precise. Just a, a, a birational transformation from B5 to the smooth projective um, quadrant. And this is very explicit, uh, what they describe, what you are blowing up, blowing down, etc. So, and uh, essentially by hand, Hassan and Chinkel proved that the, the, if B5 were additive, then there they should be some very precise uh, uh, induced action on the quadric, okay? However, uh, on the quadric, uh, they also uh, discovered uh, by hand, essentially, that there is a unique structure on the quadrant. And they described it, the boundary divisor, everything. I have to mention that this, this, this nice result for the quadric, it was uh, generalized afterwards by Sharoiko for all quadrics. But in dimension three, it was already over there. And uh, in that way, they, they obtained the, the contradiction from explicit uh, computations, I would say. Uh, well, there is a more, uh, less explicit way to see this as well. I have to mention it since I'm in a transformation group seminar. Uh, it was proven but that the automorphism group of V5 is actually PGL2. This group is connected, uh, linear of dimension three, and there is not enough space for a three-dimensional abelian uh, group inside. So it's impossible to compactify the the, the predictive space. Uh, I think I, I learned this from from Seiden. <laughs> this uh, this uh, this fact. Okay. Uh, so now let me state the the results. Um, so as uh, the title uh, says, uh, I will be mainly interested in uh, the pets of varieties. So let me just recall recall you one once again that once once you have a fan of variety. If the final index of dimension n is smooth, uh, if the final index is n plus one, then it has to be the predictive space. If the final index is n is exactly n, it has to be the quadric. So the next interesting case is the uh, the case of final index n minus one. These are called the pets of varieties because if you replace n equals two, then you get a uh, one, and you essentially are dealing with the pets of surfaces. I mean, for, for the case n equals two, this, uh, this, uh, this condition is more or less automatic. So that's why they're called the pets of varieties because they're a natural generalization of the pets of surfaces uh, to higher dimensions. And they were classified by Fujita according to their degree. So as you may know, the, um, the pets of surfaces, uh, are obtained from P2 or P1 cross P1. P2 has a degree nine, uh, uh, P1 cross P1 has degree eight. And each time you blow up a point and you get the a new del pezzo surface, the, the degree is, uh, drops by one. So essentially there are, they are classified according to the degree. That's what I wanted to say. And uh, in higher dimension, well, they have degree uh, one, two, up to eight. And we prove it, okay? So there's a very, very explicit classification by Fujita. Uh, we proved with the uh, Bajo uh, that it was, he was here the, in the last seminar, I think. Uh, we proved that uh, if you have a Del Pezzo uh, variety of dimension N, 
uh, which is additive, then there are well, there, we have a classification of these this, this varieties, and there are essentially two types. The first type is the um, how to say the variety of picard rank one. So in this case, if the picard rank is one, so as in the problem of Hirschbrook, then all these varieties are obtained in this classical construction. <laughs> this uh, take the Grassmannian, one hyperplane section. The Grassmannian has dimension six, right? This GR25. So six dimensional, take one hyperplane section, dimension five, then another one, dimension four, and that's it. So you have three examples essentially. As I already told you, if you take another hyperplane section, you get a threefold. And this threefold B5 is not an equivalent compactification of the, of the affine space, right? Because I just showed you. Um, and that's it. You have this, uh, these varieties. And for Picard uh, rank two or higher, they're all obtained essentially from the projective space. So it's P2 times P2, the blow up of P3 and a point of this product of P1s. And uh, in, this, in this last case, uh, be, thanks to the Hasset and Schinkel uh, classification, everything is completely explicit. The boundary divisor, the actions, you can count how many uh, additive, additive structures you have and so on. However, in the first case, the technique that we use it uh, is very non-explicit, I would say, is uh, based on the um, so-called variety of minimal rational tangents, BMRT. Uh, so it's a, it's a tool from analytic geometry. And the problem is that, well, it doesn't give you the boundary divisor. So it doesn't solve the here's a problem. Um, also this technique, is not uh, well behaved for, for singular varieties. Singular varieties are, are very important from the minimal model program point of view, from the classification of, of algebraic varieties, uh, uh, variational classification. Um, you have to accept singularities. Uh, so this was also somehow a problem. And, um, and uh, the, the, another thing is that the, the, the technique is, as I told you, analytic, very analytic, actually. It's based on a, some result of a Fubini and Cartan. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very hard to extend it to, say, the real numbers, even, or the rational numbers. If, but so a natural question was, what if the ground field is not algebraically closed? Uh, if you are interested in, I don't say, arithmetic geometry, you, you may be uh, happy with, uh, I don't know, K, K to be the rational numbers. But even if you don't care about, uh, about uh, how to say, arithmetic geometry, if you want to study vibrations of, uh, of varieties, uh, the generic fiber of a vibration is a variety defined of the, over the function field uh, of the base, why, let's say. Therefore, uh, even if you don't want to, to say, uh, to analyze variety defined over the, over the reals or over the rational numbers, you, if you want to treat families or fun of, of fun of varieties, or let's say families or of uh, additive uh, varieties, then you may be interested in uh, looking at non-algebraically closed fields because it helps to understand varieties in family. So this was the, the, the original motivation to, to look again at this, uh, this kind of uh, questions. And here's, here's the main theorem that we obtained with uh, Adrian de Boulot and Takashi Kishimoto. So take uh, the Grassmannian, dimension six Grassmannian, and take uh, lin uh, a linear section, okay? Maybe not a hyperplane section, but a linear section, okay? Then, if the variety is smooth, uh, there is a unique structure. Uh, as long as, as there is a structure, as uh, the dimension is four, five, or six, as I told you, these are the only uh, candidates. Uh, and moreover, we can describe the bond. So this is uh, very nice because we can solve this, uh, this here's a problem. Uh, but however, uh, Something uh, better uh, can be um, can be obtained uh, along the proof. Actually, you can take 
another hyperplane section. If this section is a smooth, then it's over because it's this B5. And I already told you that B5 is not additive. But if you allow some singularities, some terminal singularities, these are, uh, this is a slang from the minimal model program. Uh, the only thing that you may use here is that they are, I don't know, uh, isolated singularities. So they are some, uh, some points as singularities. Then there is a unique structure. If and only if uh, you have a precisely three singularities and these are nodes. So you have only three nodes as singularities. And if you take another hyperplane section, you get a surface, a Quintec del Pezzo surface. In general, if this is a smooth, once again, there's no hope to be additive because Quintic del Pezzo surfaces, a smooth Quintic del Pezzo surfaces have finite automorphism group. So there's no chance to be additive. But if you allow some mild singularities, canonical singularities, then you can uh, cook up uh, an additive structure. And actually you can uh, decide whether or not this is unique. And it depends on the singularity actually. Uh, and well, I won't get into the details, but that's the, the main result. And which is beautiful, I think, is that is the proof actually uh, give you give us much more. Uh, we can follow up the action of the absolute Gala group in during the whole proof, and uh, we can extend the, some of these results to fields of uh, a characteristic zero and but any field of characteristic zero. So I will I will give you an application at the end of the talk, okay? So that's the- uh, I'm I'm sorry, Pedro, I have a yes. question. Yes. Because you consider concrete Grassmannian, Grassmannian 2.5. Yes. You take its hyperplane section. Yes. And you say, if it is threefold, then blah, blah, blah. If this is surface, then blah, blah, blah. But how mm -hmm. it can happen? It has some fixed dimensions. This is a section of hyper. Uh, by a hyper plane of your Rasmanian. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. I how to say, yeah. Maybe it's not the best way to 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 state the result, but I wanted to say, yeah. It, it depends on the dimension and whether it's a smooth or not. Yes, uh, that's the whole point. Yeah. No, no, but uh, see, in the main theorem, there are points two and three, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so this is uh, this your hyperplane section of the Rasmanian. It has dimension three, right? Yes, yes. Uh, so it cannot be a surface. So, so what should we correct in point three? Uh, I thought that we uh, take iterative sections. So it's each section we uh, drop in the dimension. Right, Is right. So, I mean, ah, I mean so in, in point three, you, you should take one more hyperplane section. Yeah, but yeah, but it's not, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not, it's not the same. I'm how to say. Yeah, I, I should I should state it maybe in the following way. It's, take a, a linear section of dimension n, okay? If n is four, five or six, and is smooth, then it's additive uh, in a unique way. If the dimension of this hyperplane section is, it happens to be three, then it's additive uh, if and only if it has three nodes. If uh, it was a two dimensional linear section with canonical singularities, then uh, there is uh, the statement in point three. Uh, I don't know if... Uh... Uh, so, so, now I see the point, but what is the definition? What is that n-dimensional linear section? What do you mean by this? You and that the variety it... has uh, dimension n. The variety has dimension n, sorry. Excel ah, you is... Take, you take not a hyperplane, but you take some uh, subspace. And you right, that's it. it. That's it. And that's you it. say by this, uh -huh, I see. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. You do, yeah. Um, you take a, a linear subspace such that XL has dimension n. Thank you. Um, Thank you I, for uh, the clarification. Huh? Another question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Uh, uh, the uh, the best surfaces with singularities are they of degree eight and seven or not? Uh, the the sorry the. So what is the degree? Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, the degree of the surface or the singularity or the- No, the, the surface. No, it's degree, also degree, um, 
Yeah, I should mention, uh, by the way, what what is the what I mean by degree in all this uh, situation. As I told you, the for the pet varieties, the um, there is this definition of final index. The anti-canonical divisor is some multiple of something of some ample. Let's let's call this ample A. So this ample, you take you take the self intersection, and this gives you the degree. For instance, for the projective space. The anti-canonical divisor is uh, m plus one uh, hyperplane, and the self-intersection of the hyperplane is one. So the, the you declare that the that the um, projective space has degree one as fan variety. Yes, but uh, it has degree a uh, nine as uh, if you take the self-intersection of the uh, anti-canonical divisor. So in the uh, usual sense of the Ah, okay, 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 okay. I now get, I now get it. Uh, ooh, I had to do the computation because so the pet so should be not should be five in this case. I think it should be five. Yes. yes. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. Um, okay, so that's the 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 main result. Uh, so let me give you some ingredients. This, this is very funny because, okay, so to, just to summarize, uh, we have this classification of, uh, with the non-explicit method, and we revisited this, uh, this construction to obtain a more precise description of the, of the boundary divisor and to extend this result to singular varieties and non-algebraically closed fields. That's the, the whole point of the, of the, of the, of re revisiting this uh, this kind of varieties, and uh, the tool that we use it are from rational geometry. So let me give you some ingredients. Uh, so we we will uh, uh, use some very classical stuff, uh, linear projections. <laughs> it's a very to say the very first uh, maybe rational map that we learn, uh, and. Um, to do so, we will need to study linear surface spaces inside the Grassmannian. And this is very classical. It goes, goes back to Todd in the 30s, actually. It's a very nice paper by Todd explaining the geometry of lines inside P4. It's actually very beautiful. So let me fix you some notation. G will be the Grassmannian. For, I think for psychological reasons in this part, it's better to think the Grassmannian as lines in P4, OK? So you think uh, the Grassmannian in, the, in this way. So if you are in P4, you can fix a flag of uh, projective uh, subspaces, a point, a line, a plane, and a volume, right? And this is a flag in P4, okay? To this flag, you can associate the so-called super varieties. I will give you the, the, the formal definition, but please don't read it. <laughs> so this is here, it's an incidence uh, relation. I will, will mainly focus it on planes and uh, volumes. So please uh, focus your, your eyes on the, on the examples. If you're in P4 and you take a, a plane, a P2 inside P4, and you look at the lines inside this plane, of course, this is the same as the dual plane, right? The dual P2, this is dual geometry. So this is, of course, a P2, because we know that the P2 dual is P2. And this is a plane inside the Grassmann. Uh, another plane is take a, a, a point and take a volume. So think about P3. We live in P3, in P3 if you want. Uh, and takes, fix a point in P3, in, in the space, uh, and uh, look at the orthogonal uh, uh, plane in, in the space and draw lines to this, this uh, orthogonal plane. Each uh, point on this plane determines a line and vice versa. And so every point on this orthogonal plane to the point determines a line. So uh, the lines passing through a point and containing in a, in a volume is isomorphic to P2. <laughs> and if you do exactly the same thing, um, lines that passes through a point in P4, this is P3. I will show you in a, a picture in uh, right now. Uh, this will be important, very important, but I wanted to tell you that there are very explicit uh, 
how to say, linears of spaces inside the Grassmannian. This is very beautiful. Todd already, already uh, de described everything in the 30s. It's very amazing. It's only written by words. It's an amazing paper. Al almost not formula, just uh, writing. Very nice. <laughs> um, so let me, well, uh, give you a, a drawing of what I told you. <laughs> this is better than my hand, I think. Uh, so you have a point and the, that we are fixing. Uh, in P4, you take the, uh, the orthogonal hyperplane, this is a P3, and each point of this of this hyperplane determines a line uh, joining this point and P and Q. Uh, so this is a P3. Uh, so each line corresponds to a point of, in this P3, therefore this sure variety is a P3 inside the grass mine. Uh, in particular, if you want to look at uh, fancy words, if you want, the Hilbert scheme of all parametrizing all such volumes, well, it's the same as parametrizing all hyperplanes in P4. This is called P4 dual, and this is P4. So the, the Hilbert scheme is explicit, and um, yeah. this is not, I mean, not essential for the, for the rest of the talk, but I wanted to tell you because it's funny, um, uh, we can also compute the automorphism group of these hyperplane sections with, using results. I mean, we, uh, Piotrkowski and Van der Ven computed this, uh, this, uh, these automorphism groups. Uh, and, but we computed the, the induced action on the, on the relevant uh, Hilbert schemes. Uh, and well, let me just uh, show you what are the Hilbert scheme. This is just for fun and huh? no, it's not very important. I wanted to tell you only that uh, uh, everything is so explicit because it's linear algebra, as you saw, that we can uh, give explicit description description of everything. Um, so the, the planes of the Grassmannian is isomorphic to the Grassmannian. The planes 3, 1 is isomorphic to this uh, projectivization of the tangent bundle of P4. The volumes on the Grassmannian is this before that I described it to you. You can do the same if you are taking one hyperplane section. You can also describe the Hilbert schemes. Uh, for instance, the plane 2, 2 is a quadric in P4. The planes of type 3, 1 is, a, is the blow up of P4 in a point. And which is more funny, I think this is uh, important. If you take one hyperplane section, there is a unique volume inside this uh, Z. So this is very linear algebra, but it's still very beautiful, very explicit, very classical uh, uh, geometry. And if you look at the fourfold, uh, there is a, for instance, there's no volumes, no P3s inside this fourfold. Uh, and planes, you have two types of planes, as I told you, for the, there is a unique plane of type 2, 2, what, what was the plane of type 2, 2? I just, let me just recall you very briefly. You fix up a, a plane inside P4 and you look at the lines inside this plane. And this draws a, a plane inside the Grassmannian. There is a unique of those in, in, in this fourfold. However, for the other type of planes, planes of type 3, 1, you have a, con a conic of, of plane. It's very beautiful and uh, well, very, I don't know how to say, classical geometry stuff. Okay, now uh, let me go to, to the proof. Um, to, to, to analyze this, these varieties, we will use linear projections. I already described the, the linear subspaces, um, but we need it, to, we, we have to do it in a equivalent way. So the main tool, and I think this is a very important uh, result that everyone should know, is the so-called Blanchard's lemma uh, that tells you the following. You have a, a, a connected algebraic group and a proper map uh, between algebraic varieties with connected fibers, OK? So if, if you want uh, to raise this proper, I don't know, a map between projective varieties, if you want, with connected fibers, if the, so you have X to Y. If X has a, an action, a nice action of G, then you can transport this action to the, to the target Y in such a way, uh, well, in a unique way, in such a way the, the map is equivalent. 
So this is a, the Blanchard's lemma allows you to transport uh, actions. However, the, which is very subtle but very important, uh, you may not have a the, the fact if you have a dense open orbit here on the source, you may not have an, an dense open orbit in, on the target. This is not for free. So we had to to prove it, and it's a very beautiful thing that for the for additive structures. Uh, uh, it's okay. uh, sorry, sorry, I don't understand. So yes. you have such a map. Yep. Uh, this is automatically surjective or not necessary? Um, let me think. Uh, if it I is mean, dominant, in our case, if, yes, for, yep. if you have a dominant map and yep. if you have an open uh, orbit at the beginning, then you will yep. have open orbit at the end. Am I right? Uh, that's the, I think that's kind of, I mean, at least for us, it was tricky uh, because uh, you, the, 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 how to say, the, um, the action downstairs can be trivial uh, or I don't know uh, how to say. No, no, but then it will be not equivalent morphism because if you have no uh, open orbit downstairs, then generic orbits form some families. And you may take the preimage of this family and you will yeah. obtain different orbit upstairs, right? Right. Okay, we, we may discuss it later, but I think this yeah, is yeah, just- yeah. I actually, I would like to, because oh, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I wanted, I would actually wanted to, to send you some, some questions about this, this thing, uh, because I, at some point, I think uh, we, we kind of use the fact that um, the group is, is um, what to say, commutative. To 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 prove that actually, uh, if you have a, a a G structure on X, then you have also a G structure on Y, as in the case of toric varieties, for instance, and also for 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 additive varieties. Uh, I don't have an example for an, in the case of non-commutative groups, but maybe there is some example that. Uh, so I claim the following thing: if you okay. have. Uh, equivalent morphism between two varieties. Yes. And if this morphism is dominant mm -hmm. and you have a G-open orbit at the beginning, then mm -hmm. you have G-open orbit at the end. Okay. Okay, but, but we may okay, yeah. discuss okay, it. Okay. 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 Okay, maybe we can discuss. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but and another nice, nice uh, thing that we we remarked, and the, here we I, I, here I'm completely sure that we need the, to be the the vector group, because we use this uh, Hilbert uh, theorem uh, uh, that says that uh, there are no forms of the vector group in characteristic characteristic zero, as you may know, there are forms of the torus like, like the the circle over the reals. But uh, for uh, right, um, but for the um, additive group, there are no non-trivial forms. So using that this fact, uh, we can show that if you have a morphism between, uh, I mean, this this kind of morphism uh, and an additive uh, structure upstairs, then you can push down to an additive structure downstairs. And moreover, the generic fiber. Which is defined over a non algebraically closed field, uh, the function field, is also an additive variety. So you can, everything is additive uh, uh, exactly as in the toric case. Um, so well, that's, uh, well, that's a, a, a nice uh, result, I think. But it's a small improvement of the Blanchard's lemma. And uh, we will use it uh, for, for, for the argument. Uh, so let me now give you the, the proof, uh, sketch and uh, not, not all the details, but let me give you the proof. Uh, so let me start with the, the Grassmannian uh, and let me show you the existence of a J6 structure. This, uh, I will, um, of course, there are another very nice proof of the existence using Lee theoretic stuff. I will mention it at the end, but let me give you the, the, the variational geometry proof of the existence of a GA6 structure on this uh, Grassmannian. So the proof goes as follows. So 
as I told you, there are volumes. There are P3s inside this, this guy. So pick one volume, okay? So this is a, a P3 inside P9. Uh, inside when you use this blocker embedding, so you have a projection. Uh, and the, the image of the projection uh, is P5 because uh, P9 is a, the projectivization of a 10 dimensional vector space, right? P3 is the projectivization of a four dimensional uh, vector space. So it's 10 dimensional quotiented by a four dimensional vector space. You obtain a six dimensional quotient and then you projectivize, obtain P5. So this is the, the linear projection. Uh, but the, actually, it's not surjective. The image is the smooth quadric of P5, which is the Plucker quadric, is also a grass But for now, just a quadric. Um, when, as you may know, if you have a, a map which is not defined, then you blow up the center of the, the projection, and it's OK. Now you can resolve the indeterminacy locus uh, by blowing up, and you get this diagram. So the Grassmannian is six dimensional, the quadric is four dimensional, sorry. So this uh, psi has, um, you expect this psi to have uh, two dimensional fibers, right? To do all the two, to fit the dimensions. And actually um, uh, it will be the case and you will use this uh, to, to produce a, an additive instruction on G12. How? Well, uh, first of all, on the quadric, as I mentioned before, uh, we know that the, there is a unique structure. Uh, this was proven by Sharoiko. And uh, so you have an additive structure on the quadric. And for this, uh, this uh, map from G twiddle to the quadric, you actually have all the fibers are actually two dimensional, but even better, uh, this is a P2 bundle. So every fiber is a P2 and even better, this is a projectivization of a rank three vector bundle, which is, and this is very important, is canonically attached to the quadric. It's a, I won't give you the precise description, but it's actually the, the direct sum of the trivial name bundle and the so-called spinner bundle. These are very classical things that are canonically attached to the, to the quadric. This is very important uh, for, this will be important afterwards for the uniqueness uh, argument. Uh, in particular, since everything is canonical, there is a, a linearization uh, induced on this vector bundle. And uh, this is, a, you, you will have to believe me because it's a explicit computation. You can describe the sections of this bundle and you can cook up some uh, vertical uh, GA2 action compatible with the horizontal uh, GA4 structure, and then you get a GA6 structure on the on G2. G, uh, G so, but by, by uh, constructing explicit sections, actually. And uh, so, once you get this GA6 uh, structure on, on G2, you use this Blanchard lemma that tells you if you have some, something upstairs, you can push it downstairs. So, if you have something additive on G2, some additive structure on G twiddle, you can push it on G to G. And then you get you produce in a very tricky way the, the additive structure from this classical uh, result by Sharoik. It's very nice, I think, from because you only need the quadric actually to produce an action on the grass money. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, you conclude by plan shows them. For the, uh, for the uniqueness, uh, once again, there is another nice uh, Lee theoretic uh, proof. I will mention it at the very end. But from the variational point of view, uh, we do the following, uh, um, the following trick. You take all these volumes. All the, you, uh, let me just recall you. From the previous step, we projected for a volume. OK, so all these volumes are uh, parameterized by P4, right? By this Hilbert scheme of, uh, right? And uh, the thing is that the, the automorphism group of the Grassmannian is PGL5, right? And the action on, the, on this P4 is the naive one, which is transitive. Uh, okay, so you have a, a transitive uh, action of the, on the, of the automorphism group. Um, you, you pick any, any structure, 
any structure you want. There is at least one. And the thing is that this, uh, this variety that uh, parameterize these this volumes is complete. It's before, actually. <laughs> so you can invoke this very nice, very important result by Borel, Borel fixed point theorem, that tells you that you have to, uh, there, there is a fixed point in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, Hilbert scheme. Therefore, you can pick this point and do everything uh, compatible with the, with the structure. Uh, well, that's it. Uh, let me just recall you, by the way, that uh, uh, when, when you do the, this projection, you go to the quadric, and on the quadric, the action was unique. This was the result by Sharoiko. And um, the thing uh, is that G twiddle is a, some vector bundle, some P2 bundle, sorry, over this quadric, which is canonically attached to this, uh, to this quadric. And using this fact, we can prove that the, the, the structure on this G twiddle has to be unique, has to be unique because it's a canonically attached uh, object to uh, uh, a variety which uh, where the, the structure is actually unique. Using this, we can prove the uniqueness uh, on G twiddle and then uh, on the uniqueness on G by the Blanchard's lemma. And the thing is that the, um, um, we, we, we did all this construction picking one, uh, one volume and we could change of coordinates to take another volume, but the, the, the action of the automorphism group is transitive. Therefore, is everything is essentially the same up to change of coordinates. And therefore, uh, all the, the structures are equivalent. That's the, the proof in the sketch of the proof. Uh, as I told you, you can do all of, the, all of this uh, using Lee theory. This was done by Ivan and Deviatov. Uh, you can prove, first of all, the existence and the uniqueness. And actually using uh, this description of the Grassmannian as a rational homogeneous space, you can describe explicitly the action of the in Plucker coordinates by looking at the unipotent radical of the parabolic group uh, P. Uh, it's very, very explicit using matrices. You can show up the, the action. It's very, it's important to have uh, this, uh, this uh, explicit description to, to be more concrete. Um, but the, the thing is that the, the, our proof, which is of course way more, I don't know, it's not, it's not very direct, uh, will be very useful uh, um, uh, when, when, the, when the field is not algebraically close. So this, is the, this was the whole point of doing this, uh, um, this birational geometric uh, proof. Um, I should mention that there are very recent works but to, um, uh, concerning fun of variety, the, the finding of non-algebraically closed fields of characteristic zero by, by Kuznetsov, uh, Prokhorov, uh, Shramov. Uh, they're looking at these varieties as well. And so we were also pretty much inspired by, by their work, of course. Um, the boundary divisor, as I told you, we can do it very specific. Uh, we can give a, an explicit description. And which is funny now is that for, for the existence and the uniqueness, we use a, a volume to, the pro, to project, right? Uh, onto a quadric. Now, which this is very funny, we have to take a plane. This is the better way to, to describe the, if you take a plane and do exactly the same thing, you now get a rational map onto P6, right? Uh, let me, because, P9 is the projectivization of a 10 dimensional vector space, P2 of a three dimensional. So it's 10 dimensional quotient by three dimensional, you get a seven dimensional vector space, you projectivize, you get P6. So you get a map from G to P6, which is very nice because G, the Grassmannian has dimension six as well as P6. <laughs> so this is, has a, a lot of chances to be birational and it's actually birational. And you can describe this boundary divisor, which I, we called R, uh, is uh, in this way. This this a diagram. So take the let me let me explain you this this uh, this drawing. Is uh, you take the Grassmannian and you take this projection. This guy is birational. To um, and there is an explicit link 
which is the following. You take the center of the projection, which is a plane, you will blow up uh, and you get the, uh, well, the blow up of uh, the grass mine along this plane. And this, this variety upstairs has another contraction to P6. And we can describe this uh, contraction way uh, in a very explicit way. This is the blow up of a trifold T, which is isomorphic to P1 cross P2. And once again, uh, the way to describe this is a very, how to say, connected with very classical things in um, projective geometry, uh, things that we learned maybe in our first course of algebraic geometry. <laughs> you learn, we learned that if you are you have P1 cross P2, you can uh, consider the second embedding, right? And this gives you an embedding to P5, right? Um, and this P5, uh, will be actually a hyperplane inside this P6. And this will be the complement of the, of the dense open orbit. So you have a six a G6, you have the dense open orbit, you, you transport everything to P6, you have a dense open orbit. Uh, the complement is a hyperplane in P6, it's a P5. And inside this P5, you have this P1 cross P2 embedded as the as the, as the Segre embedding. It's very, very classical also, very beautiful because it, I don't know, it reminds you the very first course of algebraic geometry, I don't know. <laughs> um, and this is the threefold and the, the, the variety um, uh, upstairs is the blow up of this T. Uh, uh, so in this way, you can describe the, the boundary device or it's rather explicit, you can do it actually explicitly thanks to the using two current coordinates if, if you want. And which is amazing, I think, is that, as I told you, as you may know, there are infinite, infinitely many additive structures on P6. So it's, it was a very tricky problem actually at the very beginning for us to say, okay, we have a, an a explicit birational morphism uh, from a Grassmannian, which we know that has a unique additive structure on 2p6, which has infin infinitely many. So which one? And actually it's the naive one. And you can prove that thanks to this explicit description uh, uh, in coordinates, uh, thanks to Ivan's work and uh, Deviato's work. But, so it's, it's very, uh, uh, very nice and very, I think it's very beautiful that among all possible structures is the most naive one. So this is the connection between the Grassmannian and P6. And which is amazing, I think, is that for, for the other sections, uh, the five dimensional and the four dimensional, right? Uh, the fourfold and the, sorry, the fivefold and the fourfold is just, you ha only have to take an hyperplane section for the previous diagram. So you consider this diagram and take a hyperplane section up you take this, so you, you do exactly the same thing. You take a plane, you project. Now, in the case of FIFOs, you are not going to P5, but to, sorry, to P6, but to P5. And uh, instead of a trifold, you have to blow out a surface. And this surface is the Hirschberg surface F1, which you, it's a very classical object as well. And is contained in P4, seen as a hyperplane section of this P5. So you have this open orbit in P5. The complement is a, a hyperplane of dimension a P4. And inside this P4, you have this here's the work surface, and then you blow up. And for four folds, the same story. Uh, you pick a plane, which is unique, by the way, in this uh, four fold. You project, you get to P4. Inside this P4, you have a hyperplane, which is a P3. And inside this P3, you have the twisted cubic, which is also very classical from algebraic geometry. And you have to blow up the twisted cubic and then uh, uh, go, uh, go back. Um, also very important, I mean, I think it's funny because it's a, a very funny hist historical remark um, is that um, Veil, Andre Veil uh, classified in the fifties, I think, uh, all smooth uh, projective varieties of the grid three, which are not hypersurfaces. 
of course you have degree three hypersurfaces, but if you like at degree three varieties, which are not hypersurfaces, there are only three varieties, the twisted cubic, F1, the, the, this surface, and uh, P1 cross P2 inside P5. So these are the only uh, degree three uh, um, uh, projective varieties which are not uh, smooth, which are not uh, hypersurfaces. This is very funny. It's just a, it's a coincidence, a coincidence. I don't know. And in all these cases, by the way, the induced action in the projective space is the naive one as well. So uh, this is the proof. Uh, let me just sketch, sketch very briefly because I wanted to, to show you the application. The singular case, this is just the, uh, invoking some other results. This will be very brief. Um, for, two, for three faults, uh, for terminal three faults, there is a classification uh, of GFANO three faults by Prokhorov. Uh, we look at the all the classification. You look at the Quintic del Pezzo trifold, and they are classified depending on the number of, of nodes uh, they have as, as singularities. So they might have one node, two nodes, or three nodes. Okay, this is the uh, a long work by, uh, by Prokhorov. It was already already there. So in the case of one node or two nodes, you you take your singular variety. You modify this variety by rationally a little bit. This is so-called Q factorization. It's a fancy word. I, I want to explain it. But it's a, it's a rational map. And you get another variety, which is smooth in this particular case. And this is the projectivization of a vector bundle. And we show that this, uh, this variety is not additive. because And in order to show this, we, um, we use this result, which I think is an uh, interesting uh, by itself is that if you have a, a normal projective variety and a simple vector bundle, simple means, as you may know, that the only endomorphisms are dilatations, right? Homothesis. This is simple. Uh, then uh, the, the projective, projectivization is not additive. And in this uh, point two, it happens that the, all the, the vector bundles that appear are simple, and therefore the varieties are not additive. I, I should mention, by the way, that stable vector bundles are simple. So this, this proposition also tells you that uh, additive projectivization, uh, so projectivization of vector bundles, which are additive, are far away from the stable uh, locus of vector bundle. So it's, it should be hard to classify them because we only, only know that there are moduli spaces and stuff like that for stable and semi-stable uh, vector bundles. So, so yeah, additive varieties that are obtained as projectivization of vector bundles tends to be unstable. So uh, the, the vector bundle tends to be unstable. Uh, so it's uh, kind of weird as well. But anyway, just a, a, a weird remark. And to, to, to end uh, with the trifle case, I uh, just mentioned that uh, I want to mention that if you have uh, three, um, three nodes, uh, Prokhorov showed that there is a variational map. Uh, uh, the variety is variational to the blow up of P3, of P3 sorry, at three points. And this is, of course, uh, in general position additive because if you have three points on the space, you can. Uh, Look at the plane spanned by these three points, right? And you can, you of course, you can cook up an action additive structure. So it's such that this hyperplane, this plane, sorry, is the the complement of the action. Okay? The, you have the naive action, right? The naive action on P three, where the in the complement in this plane, every single point is fixed. So you have you can you can do it and it's fine. So this is uh, the proof in that case. And in the in dimension two, uh, the, the hard work was already done by Derental Lurgan. They, they studied the, um, the existence of uh, additive structures on the pets of surfaces. And in the case of degree three, uh, degree five, sorry, uh, they showed that the, the only possibilities are this kind of singularities, A3 and A4. So the only remaining question actually was the uniqueness. 
and we analyzed uh, the uniqueness using uh, explicit equations uh, that were provided by Ivan Sheltsov and Yuri Prokhorov quite recently. So using these explicit models, we, we managed to discover the uniqueness. Around. And um, to finish, let me give you an application. Um, if the field is, uh, as, I as I promised, if the field is uh, of characteristic zero, but maybe not algebraically close, uh, say the reals, <laughs> the rational numbers, then uh, every form of uh, the Pezzo variety of degrees five uh, of dimension four or five, <laughs> What is a form is a variety, define I mean, a scheme if you want, define the, the field such that when you base change to the algebraic uh, closure, uh, some algebraic closure, then it becomes isomorphic to the to the variety that I'm I was telling you the, the hyperplane se uh, linear section of the Grassmann. Okay, so the 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 result tells you that if you are in dimension four and or five, there are, all the forms are trivial. In other words, you don't have to extend your field to, uh, in order to, to the variety being isomorphic to the linear section uh, of the Grassmannian. So this is was uh, this was actually quite surprising for us because uh, there are forms of the Grassmannian. For instance, let me just to convince yourself. Are ready for the projective space? If you are uh, P one. P1 uh, over the complex numbers is the same as a conic, but over the reals, you may have, of course, conics that no, with no rational points, right? X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals to zero is a conic, but over the reals, there are no solutions. But over the complex numbers, you have uh, plenty of them, and this is isomorphic to the projective line. So this is a form of the, of the projective space. And for the Grassmannians, you also have forms and for the threefold B, B5, you also have forms, uh, but it's kind of weird that if you're in dimension six, you have forms. Uh, in dimension five, all of them are trivial. In dimension four, all of them are trivial. And in dimension three, you also have forms. <laughs> it's very weird, but you can deduce this from the, from the proof. Uh, let me just give you a small idea of why it's true. For instance, for uh, dimension five, I told you that you are blowing up this surface, F1. F1 is a very classical thing, is the is a Hirschberg surface, which is isomorphic to the blow up of P2 at one point. If you were, it was a form of this of this variety, is the form of a of something and a point. And when you base change to the algebraic closure, is P2 and a point. The thing is that uh, it's a pair. So uh, if you 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 if you have the Galo, the absolute Galo group acting, the point that were uh, in this pair has to be fixed because it's a distinguished uh, point. So this point, since it's Galo invariant, has to be defined over over the field, the base field, and therefore you have a, a form of P two with a with a rational point. And you can show that, therefore, this has to be a real P2, uh, sorry, an actual P2, an honest P2. So this F1 is actually, uh, has a, it's a trivial form. And you can deduce in that way that uh, uh, you have a, a rational point and then using this uh, additive structure, actually you have a, a lot of rational points and then it's, uh, the, the form is true. Uh, so this is kind of uh, funny. It was a, a nice application from from this construction uh, that I wanted to to tell you uh, because it wasn't expected at all uh, because it's not true for in dimension six and dimension three but it's true in dimension four and five and just to finish I wanted to tell you also that one of our original motivations uh, was that uh, Prokhorov as I told you at the very beginning classify the compactifications of uh, a four into this uh, the, uh, the pets of four folds of degree five, and they were they were four non-isomorphic uh, ways to compactify the affine space. Only one is additive, and 
we can uh, we can describe which which one in the Prokhorov classification. So and the 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 other three are compactifications of A4, but not equivalent compactifications of the vector group. And that's the end. Thank you very much for the for the time, for the questions, for the attention. Thank you very much, Pedro, for your talk. In fact, very many interesting results, and to me personally, I learned a lot. Uh, dear colleagues, do we have questions, comments? If not, then let me ask, uh, do we have some plans? Uh, what can be done for them? Uh, yeah, I, I, well, one thing, uh... I think I don't know. As, as, uh, it's actually a question it's for you as well. Is uh, what happens in positive characteristic even for the projective space? I don't know. Uh, this has uh, has a Schinkel correspondence in characteristic p. I don't know uh, what what should be fixed uh, because since you are taking exponentials, it's kind of tricky, right? Uh, uh, that's one thing, uh, and from the more uh, from more algebraic part, and for the more geometric part, I think I would like to to continue with these uh, families because our main motivation to study these kind of varieties was to look at the function fields and to try to study families of additive varieties. What happens in family? Because here, the uh, one of your result is that this edge direction is unique. I don't yeah. know whether this is a coincidence or this is some manifestation of some general effect. And certainly yeah. it's interesting to find some object like projective spaces when you have right, continuous right. families of additive right, yeah, 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 yeah. No more questions. Uh, can I uh, clarify one thing? Uh, so uh, you in the main, in the middle of your talk you said that uh, if we have Delpet's uh, variety then it's either uh, uh, intersection of Grassmannian with hyperplane mm -hmm. or three more varieties yes it's ah, yes. Uh, and it you was. said that mm -hmm. uh, in these three cases it's easy to uh, describe additive actions am I right yes in the last two uh, yeah the second line yes. And uh, and uh, and I kind of just want to clarify one of them is, for example, for blow up uh, of projective space. Uh, kind of what is idea of classifications, additive actions? Ah, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, the, the 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 thing is that uh, also by this Blanchard's lemma, uh, essentially you can push out, uh, you can um, push the the additive structure to P3 actually. So uh, you are essentially, um, how to say, uh, reduce it to, 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 to the classification of the structures in P3, uh, which is was done by Hassan and Schinkel. And then uh, in, on P3, you can uh, describe uh, the fixed locus, everything. Uh, you have an explicit description of the action, and then you can blow up and uh, and use the the formulas of the blow up to 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 see how the action look uh, upstairs. Uh, for instance, that's uh, I was uh, I was trying to say actually that since these three varieties in the second line involves the projective space, we can actually in, uh, essentially reduce our the treatment to 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 the study that the uh, Hasset and Schinkel already. Yeah. What has it and she already did? Uh, for, for, for any products of projective spaces, we also can, uh, can classify <coughs> additive action. Is this? <coughs> it, is, it has to be the product action, right? That's that's right. For instance, yeah. for instance, since uh, for P1, the action is unique, for P1, cross P1, cross P1, the only action is the, the naive one uh, is the uh, matrices by, by uh, uh, the, 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 product, uh, the product action. Uh -huh. okay. So in the case of this blow up, uh, this Blanchard lemma says that uh, the only way to obtain additive action on such a blow up is to take a fixed point for the additive action on P3 and blow up this fixed point. That's it. That's, it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay, no more questions. And do you have some research group uh, in your university which works on this kind of questions? Uh, well, right, right now we have a, a PhD student which is looking at uh, some of these uh, uh, arithmetic uh, uh, implications of being uh, being uh, uh, additive. You know, this distribution of rational points and stuff like that with the uh, uh, Chamberlain and Schinkel. Uh, but uh, if you have some some ideas or problems in mind, I would like to. I will be. I love to. I would love to to to, to, to discuss about it uh, with Alvaro Liendo, actually, which is not at my university. We we are trying to to think about something maybe related with these kind of things. Okay. And also, we will be very grateful if you can send us your presentation. Sure, we can sure, sure. And we can put it on the website. So of course, yeah. With, I will send it to you right now. Listen, dear colleagues. Any more questions, comments? If not, then let me thank again Pedro very much for his beautiful talk. And we hope for further connections and discussions of this circle of questions.